Hi, I'm Gavin Mazzetti, and I will be reading The Landlady by Roald Dahl. Let's begin. Billy Weaver had traveled down the London, traveled down from London on the slow afternoon train, with a change at reading on the way. And by the time he got to Bath, it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and the moon was coming up out of the clear, starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. The air was deadly cold, and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. Excuse me, he said. Was there a fairly cheap hotel not too far away from here? Try the Bell and Dragon, the porter answered, pointing down the road. They might take you in. It's about a quarter mile of a on, along the other side. Billy thanked him and picked up his suitcase to set out to walk the quarter mile to the Bell and Dragon. He had never been to Bath before. He didn't know anyone who lived there. But Mr. Greenslade, at the head office in London, had told him it was a splendid town. Find your own lodgings, he said, and then go along and report to the branch manager as soon as you got yourself settled. Billy was 17 years old. He was wearing a new navy blue overcoat and a new brown trilby hat and a new brown suit, and he was feeling fine. He walked briskly down the street. He was trying to do everything briskly now these days. Briskiness, had he had decided, was one common characteristic of all successful businessmen. The big shots up at the head office were absolutely fantastically brisk all the time. They were amazing. There were no shops on this wide street that he was walking along, only a line of tall houses on each side, all of them identical. They had porches and pillars and four or five steps going up to their front doors. It was obvious that once upon a time they had been a very swanky residence. But now, even in the darkness, he could see that the paint was peeling from the woodwork on their doors and windows. The handsome white facades were cracked and blotchy from the neglect. Suddenly, in a downstairs window that was brilliantly illuminated by a street lamp not six yards away, Billy caught sight of a printed notice propped up against the glass in one upper pane. It said, bed and breakfast. There was a vase of yellow chrysanthemums, tall and beautiful, standing underneath the notice. He stopped walking. He moved a bit closer. Greed curtains, sort of velvety material, were hanging down on either side of the window. The chrysanthemums looked wonderful beside them. He went right up and peered through the glass in the room. The first thing he saw was a bur bright fire burning in the hearth. On the carpet in front of the fire, a pretty little dachshund was curled up asleep with its nose tucked into its belly. The room itself, so far he could see in the half-darkness, was filled with pleasant furniture. There was a baby grand piano and a big sofa and several plump armchairs. In one in the corner, he spotted a large parrot in a cage. Animals were usually a good sign in a place like this. Billy told himself, and all in all, it looked to him as though it would be a pretty decent house to stay in. Certainly, it would be more comfortable than the Bell and Dragon. On the other hand, a pub would be more conjugal than a boarding house. There would be beer and darts in the evenings and lots of people to talk to. It would probably be a good bit cheaper, though, too. He had stayed a couple of nights in a pub once, and he had liked it. He had never stayed in any boarding houses, and to be perfectly honest, he was a tiny bit frightened of them. The name itself conjured to the image of watery cabbage, rapacious landladies, and a powerful smell of kippers in the living room. After ditherings about like this in the cold for two or three minutes, Billy decided that he would go walk on and take a look at the bell and dragon before making up his mind. He turned to go. And now a queer thing happened to him. He was in the act of stepping back and turning away from the window when all at once his eye was caught in the most peculiar manner by the small notice that there was there. Bed and breakfast, it said. Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. Bed and breakfast. Each word was like a large black eye, staring at him through the glass, holding him, compelling him forcing him to stay where he was and not walk away from that house. The next thing he knew, he was actually moving across the window to the front door of the house, climbing the steps that led up to it and reaching for the bell. 
he pressed the bell. Far away in a back room, he heard it ringing, and then at once, must have been at once, because he hadn't even, he hadn't even had time to take his finger from the bell button. The door swung open, and a woman was standing there. Normally, you ring a bell, and you have to wait at least half a minute before the door opens. But this dame was like a jack-in-the-box. He pressed the bell, and she popped out, made him jump. She was about 40 five or fifty years old. The moment she saw him, she gave him a warm, welcoming smile. Please come in, she said pleasantly. She stepped aside, holding the door wide open, and Billy found himself automatically starting forward. The compulsion, or more accurately, the desire to follow her into that house was extraordinarily strong. I saw the notice in the window, he said, holding himself back. Yes, I know. I was wondering about a room. It's all ready for you, my dear, she said. She had a round pink face and very gentle blue eyes. I was on my way to the Bell and Dragon, Billy told her. The notice in your window just happened to catch my eye. My dear boy, she said, why don't you come in out of the cold? How much do you charge? Five and six pence a night, including breakfast. It was fantastically cheap. It was less than half of what he had been willing to pay. If that is too much, she added then perhaps I can reduce it just a tiny bit. Do you desire an egg for breakfast? Eggs are expensive at the moment. It would be six pence less without egg. Five and six pence is fine, he answered. I should like to stay very much here. I knew you would. Do come in. She seemed terribly nice. She looked exactly like the mother of one's best friend in school, welcoming one into the house to stay for the Christmas holidays. Billy took off his hat and stepped over the threshold. Just hang it there, she said, and let me help you with your coat. There were no other hats or coats in the wall. There were no umbrellas, no walking sticks, nothing. We have it all to ourselves, she said, smiling at him over her shoulder as she led the way upstairs. You see, it isn't very often I have the pleasure of taking a visitor into my nest. The old girl is slightly dotty, Billy told himself, but at least five, but five and six pence a night? Who really cares about that? I should have thought you'd be simply swamped with applicants, he said politely. Oh, I am, my dear. Of course I am. But the trouble is I'm inclined to be just a teensy, wincy, choosy, and particular, if you see what I mean. Ah, yes, but I'm always ready. Everything is always ready, day and night, in this house just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman will come along. And that, and it is such a pleasure, my dear, such a very great pleasure, when now and again I open a door and see someone standing there who's just exactly right. She was halfway up the stairs, and she paused with one hand on the stair rail, turning her head and smiling down with him with pale lips. Like you, she added. And her blue eyes traveled slowly all the way down the length of Billy's body to his feet and then up again. On the second floor landing, she said to him, this floor is mine. They climbed up another flight. And this one is all yours, she said. Here's your room. I do hope you like it. She took him into a small but charming front bedroom, switching on the light as she went in. The morning sun comes right in the window. Mr. Perkins, is it? Mr. Perkins, isn't it? No, he said. It's Weaver. Mr. Weaver, how nice. I put a ball of water in between the sheets to air them out. My Weaver, Mr. Weaver, it is such a comfort to have a hot water bottle in a strange bed with clean sheets. Don't you agree? Anyway, light the gas fire at any time if you do feel chilly. Thank you, Billy said. Thank you ever so much. He noticed that the bedspread had been taken off the bed and that the bedcloths had neatly had been neatly turned back on one side, all ready for someone to get in. I'm so glad you appeared, she said, looking earnestly into his face. I was beginning to get worried. That's all right, Billy began to answer brightly. You mustn't worry about me. He put his suitcase on the chair and started to open it. What about supper, my dear? Did you manage to get anything to eat before you came here? I'm not a bit hungry, thank you, he said. 
I think I'll just go to my bed as soon as possible, because tomorrow I've got to get up rather early and report to the office. Very well then. I'll leave you down I'll leave you now so that you can unpack. But before you go to bed, would you be kind enough to pop into the sitting room on the ground floor and sign the book? Everyone has to do that now because it's the law of the land, and we don't want to go breaking any laws at this stage of proceedings, do we? She gave him a little wave of hand and went quickly out of the room and closed the door. Now, the fact that his landlady appeared to be slightly off her rocker didn't worry Billy in the least. After all, she was not only harmless, there was no question about that, but she was also quite obviously a kind and generous soul. He guessed that she had probably lost a son at war, or something like that. She had never gotten over it. So a few minutes later, after unpacking his suitcases and washing his hands, he trotted downstairs to the ground floor and entered his living room. His landlady wasn't there. The fire was glowing in the hearth, and the little Dachshund was still sleeping soundly in the front of it. The room was wonderfully warm and cozy. I'm a lucky fellow, he thought, rubbing his hands. This is a bit of all right. He found the guest book lying open on the piano. So he took out his pen and wrote down his name and address. There are only two other entries of his on the page. And as one always does with guest books, he started to read them. He saw one was Christopher Mulder, Holland from Cardiff, and the other one was Gregory W. Temple from Bristol. That's funny, he thought suddenly. Christopher Mullenhond. It rings a bell. Now where on earth had he heard that rather unusual name for? Was it a boy at school? No. Was it one of his sister's numerous young men, perhaps? Or a friend of his father's? No. No. It wasn't any of those. He glanced down against, again at the book. Christopher Mullenhand. 231 Cathedral Road, Cardiff. Gregory W. Temple, 27 Sycamore Drive, Bristol. As a matter of fact, now, he came to think of it. He wasn't sure that the second name didn't have almost of a familiar ring about it as the first. Gregory Temple, he said aloud, searching his memory. Christopher Mullenholland. Such charming boys, a voice behind him answered. She turned... As, and as he turned, he saw a landlady sailing into the room with a large silver tea tray in her hands. She was holding it well out in front of her, rather high up, as though the tray were a pair of reins in a frisky horse. They sound familiar somehow, he said. They do? How interesting. I'm almost positive I've heard those names before. Isn't that odd? Maybe it was in the newspapers. They weren't famous in any way, were they? I mean, famous cricketers or footballers or something like that? Famous, she said, setting the tea tray down on the low table in front of the sofa. Oh no, I don't think they were famous, but they were incredibly handsome. Both of them, I can promise you that. They were tall and young and handsome, my dear, just exactly like you. Once more, Billy glanced down at the book. Look here, he said, noticing the dates. This is the last entry, it's over two years old. It is? Yes, indeed. Christopher Mullenhund is nearly a year before that, more than three years ago. Dear me, she said, shaking her head and heaving a dainty little sigh. I would never have thought it. How, many, how time does fly away from all, doesn't it, Mr. Wilkins? It's Weaver, Billy said. W-E-A-V-E-R. Oh, of course it is, she cried, sitting down on the sofa. How silly of me. I do apologize in one ear and out the other. That's me, Mr. Weaver. You know something, Billy said. Something really quite extraordinary about all this? No, dear, I don't. Well, you see, both of these names, Mulholland and Temple, not only do I seem to remember each one of them separately, so to speak, somehow or the other, in some peculiar way, they both appear to be connected together as well, as though they were both famous for some sort of thing. If you see what I mean, like, well, Dempsey or Turney, for example, Churchill or Roosevelt. How amusing, she said. But come over here now, dear, and sit down beside me on, so on a sofa, and I'll give you a nice cup of tea and a ginger biscuit before you go to bed. You really shouldn't bother, Billy said. I didn't mean you to do anything like that. He stood by the piano, watching her as she fussed about with the cups and saucers. He noticed that she had a small 
white, quickly moving hands and red fingernails. I'm almost positive it was in the newspapers. I saw them, Billy said. I'll think of it in a second. I'm sure I will. There's nothing more tantalizing than, than a thing like this that lingers out just outside the borders of one's memory. He hated to give up. Now, wait a minute, he said. Wait just a minute. Mulholland. Christopher Mulholland. Wasn't that the name of the Eton schoolboy uh, who was walking on a tour through the West Country and then all of a sudden, milk, she said, and sugar? Yes, please. And then all of a sudden, Eton schoolboy, she said. Oh, no, my dear, that can't be right. Because Mr. Mullenholland was certainly not an Eden schoolboy when he came to me. He was from, he was a Cambridge undergraduate. Come over here now and sit next to me and warm yourself in front of this lovely fire. Come on, your tea's all ready for you. She patted the empty place beside on her on the sofa. She sat there smiling at Billy, waiting for him to come over. He crossed the train. He crossed the room slowly and sat down on the edge of the sofa. She placed his teacup on the table in front of him. There we are, she said. How nice and cozy this is, isn't it? Billy started sipping his tea. She did the same. For half a minute or so, neither of them spoke. Billy knew that she was right looking at him. Her body was half turned towards him. He could feel her eyes resting on his face, watching him over the rim of her teacup. Now and again, he caught a whiff or of a peculiar smell that seemed to anaminate directly from a person. It was not the least unpleasant, and it reminded him, well, he wasn't quite sure of what it reminded him of. Pickled walnuts, new leather, was at the corridors of a hospital. At length, she said, Mr. Mulland was a great one for his tea. Never in my life have I seen him drink as much tea as dear. Sweet Mr. Mulholland. I suppose he left fairly recently, Billy said. He was still puzzling his head about the two names. He was positive now that he had seen them in the newspapers, in the headlines. Left, she said, arching her bows. But my dear boy, he never left. He's still here. Mr. Temple is also here. They're on the fourth floor, both of them together. Billy set his cup down slowly on the table and stared at the landlady, smiled back at him. She put out one of her white hands and patted him comfortingly on the knee. How old are you, my dear? She asked. Seventeen. Seventeen, she cried. Oh, that is the perfect age. Mr. Mulholland was also seventeen, but I think he's a trifle shorter than you are. In fact, I'm sure he was. His teeth weren't quite so white. But you have the most beautiful teeth, Mr. Weaver. Did you know that? They're not as good as they look, Billy said. They've got simply masses of fillings in them in the back. Mr. Temple, of course, was a little older, she said ignoring his remark. He was actually 28, and yet I would never have guessed it if he hadn't told me. Never in my whole life. There wasn't a blemish on his body. A what, Billy said? His skin was just like a baby's. There was a pause. Billy picked up his teacup and took another sip of his tea, and then he set it down again, gently into its saucer. He waited for her to say something else, which seemed to have lapsed on into another of her silences. He sat there, staring straight ahead of him into the far corner of his room, biting his lower lip. That parrot, he said at last. You know something, it had me completely fooled when I first saw it through the window. I could have sworn it was alive. Alas, no longer. It's most terribly clever the way it's been done, he said. It doesn't look like it in the least bit dead. Who did it? I did. You did? Of course, she says. And you have met my little Basil as well. She nodded towards the dash current, curled so, up so comfortably in front of the fire. Billy looked at it, and suddenly he realized that the animal had all the time been as silent and motionless as the parrot. He put out a hand and touched it gently on the top of its back. The, black was, the back was hard and cold. And when he pushed the hair to one side with his fingers, he could see the skin underneath, grayish, black, and dry, and perfectly preserved. Good gracious me, he said. How absolutely fascinating. 
He turned away from the dog and stared with a deep admiration at the little woman beside him on the sofa. It must be most awfully difficult to do a thing like that. Not in the least, she said. I stuff all my little pets myself when they pass away. Will you have another cup of tea? No, thank you, Billy said. The tea tasted faintly of bitter almonds. He didn't care much for it. Did You signed the book, didn't you? Oh, yes. That's good, because later on, if I happen to forget what you were called, I could always come down here and look it up. I still do that almost every day with Mr. Mulholland and Mr. Mr. Temple, Billy said. Gregory Temple, excuse me, excuse my asking, but haven't there been any other guests here except for them in the last two or three years? Holding her teacup high in one hand, inclining her head to the left, she looked up at him. Out of corners of her eyes, she gave him another gentle little smile. No, my dear, only you.